All right, hey friends, we are going to start this next part of our lesson, and this is going to be intervals part two, where we're gonna go a little bit more in depth with these. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what's going on with them and uh, some more things about how they are constructed and how we label them. So let's go ahead and first thing we're gonna do, we are going to review just a little bit here, uh, some basic things from our last lesson. So please remember, an interval refers to the distance between two pitches. And there are two primary types of interval. There are melodic intervals and there are harmonic intervals. A melodic interval is going to occur in succession. It means that they come one after another and they are read horizontally going from left to right. Melodic intervals are typically going to be moving up or down. Sometimes we'll say like, you know, a fifth above or a third below, various different things like that. Harmonic intervals, on the other hand, are going to occur simultaneously, meaning that they are going to be read vertically. They are happening at the same time. So that's when you're playing multiple notes on the keyboard and saying that we are using, you know, a third or a fifth or a seventh or what have you, things like that. Within the categories, remember we have simple and compound intervals. A simple interval is an interval that is less than or equal to one octave. Now this was something that we actually had a little bit of confusion on with our checkout form. <clears throat> a lot of us were saying that a uh, simple interval was greater than an octave, which it is not, okay folks? A simple interval is less than or equal to one octave. So we are talking about unisons, seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, sevenths, and octaves. Now, unison and octave here are, to be, are used to be more clear about what's actually happening. So they are not a first and an eighth because a pitch with the same frequency, meaning that it is vibrating at the exact same wavelength, is called a unison because they are together. They are in unison. A pitch with exactly double the frequency, meaning it's going twice as fast, is called an octave. So when we're talking about unisons and octaves, we are actually talking more about frequencies and things like that. So that's why we use those terms as opposed to saying a first or an eighth. All right, <clears throat> a compound interval is going to be greater than one octave. So we are talking about things like ninths, tenths, elevenths, twelfths, thirteenths, and fourteenths. Now remember, getting into like fifteenths and above, we are talking about things that are like in the double octave or two octaves above where we are at that moment. And realistically, we don't really need to worry about those at this time because it's a very large interval and we are not really going to dive into that. We're going to keep things simple so you can understand the concepts. Okay, moving on we are going to review how to find an interval. Now this slide should look familiar because I copy and pasted it from our last lesson. When counting the intervals, we are always going to count the pitch starting as one, the starting pitch as number one. And even though it might seem a little bit odd, we absolutely have to include that pitch right there, that starting pitch in our counting because otherwise we're going to be off. So remember, the interval takes place between these two notes and we have to count those two pitches in order to make sure we have the correct interval. So we count all of the pitches that are between C and G and that gives us D, E, and F. So adding that to our two pitches that we started with, we see that we have five pitches, C, D, E, F, and G. So once we have that, the number is going to become its name. So the interval name is going to be a fifth. Now it is not a five because that means something different in music. So we refer to it as a fifth to talk about the distance between those two notes. And that's universally understood by musicians that if you say, oh, we wanna go a fifth above C, most musicians, if they've had you know training and like you guys are having right now, will know that we're talking about the note G, things like that. So calling it a five would not be the correct answer. We call it a fifth, all right? So moving on here, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get uh, into the types of intervals that we have. So yes, we do have two primary types. We're breaking this down into subgroups now. So as always with music things, we're going to start large and we're going to slowly get smaller and smaller and smaller and talk about more 
um, kind of uh, specialized concepts here. So previously, like it says here, we learned about simple and compound intervals in the harmonic and melodic strategies, or uh, categories, excuse me, strategies. So these are important terms, but each interval is going to receive something called a modifier, and it's going to describe exactly what the pitch is doing when it is associated with that part of inter the interval. So in order to construct the interval the correct way, we need to not only know its distance, so the, the number, and we also do need to know its modifier. So finding the distance is only half of the process, and the modifiers that we're going to be examining today are perfect, major, and minor, as you can see those bullet points right there. So the three modifiers are going to be discussed using the C major scale. <clears throat> now, we probably need to talk about what the C major scale is. Unless you have taken some kind of band lesson or piano lesson or voice lesson, you very likely don't know what scales are. So the C major scale, we're going to be using this because it is one of the very first ones, if not the absolute first one that we learn on the piano. And it's because C only uses the white keys to construct the scale. So that term right there, scale, is a fundamental part of music that is constructed from a series of whole and half steps. I would hazard a guess that probably better than 98% of the music that we listen to is based on some kind of scale or another. Now, of course, there are pieces of music that don't use scales. They just use notes and they will use various different pitches and all this kind of other stuff to create them. But most of what we call Western art music, which is what we study when we become musicians uh, in the basic stuff, when we study that, 98% of what we do is based off of scales. So looking at this diagram right here, this uh, little piece of music, we have a series of whole and half steps. So to construct any scale, it is the same pattern, any major scale, I should say. It is the exact same pattern. So you're going to have a whole step between the first two pitches, a whole step between the second and third, a half step between three and four, a whole step between four and five, whole between five and six, whole between six and seven, and then a final half step, which we refer to as the leading tone. So we got that little extra bonus in there for you. Leading tone, <clears throat> the half step between the seventh and the octave right there. Now, this does also apply when you are coming up from below. We still have the same series of whole and half steps. Now, if looking at the sheet music like this is not really helping you, we're going to take a look at the piano keys with uh, the keyboard and accidentals. So think back to how we named those keys and we talked about those accidentals. So looking at this keyboard here, we can see that the series of whole and half steps uh, can be visualized by looking at these keys. So a whole step determ is determined by whether or not there is an accidental key, so that black key right there, between the two pitches. So we would go from C to D. We have a whole step because there's that C sharp or D flat in between them. Another whole step here. Now notice that we do not have a whole step right here because there is no accidental key. So there is our first half step from E to F here in our C major scale. As we continue through, we can see that we have more whole steps and then our final half step, that leading tone, going from B up to C right there because it is, a, once again, missing that whole step between them. It's missing that black key accidental. So hopefully this helps a little bit talking about what a scale is. And some of you are probably wondering, like, Mr. Ouellette, why do we need to know about scales? And it is an excellent question. Uh, so in order to create intervals, we need, with their modifier, we do need to understand the pitches that are used in different scales. We're using C major because it doesn't have any accidentals. It is all white keys on the piano. There are no sharps, there are no flats that we need to be concerned with at this moment. Building intervals off the C major scale helps you understand the concept. So when even when I learned how to do this stuff, it was all built off of the C major scale because there were no accidentals that I have to contend with. There's nothing that I need to look and, and really think harder about and say, oh, okay, so now I have to work on half steps and whole steps. It's all right there for you. So once you know the concept of how to do these intervals, the major, minor, perfect, whatever, you can 
apply this to other keys. Now in total, fun fact, we have 12 keys. You could potentially create intervals in all 12 keys once you understand these concepts. So one of the, the things that I like to say is it's, it's just like learning to walk before you run. So, you know, to quote Marvel here a little bit, unless you are Tony Stark in the first Iron Man movie telling uh, Jarvis that he needs to run before he walks, all of us start by walking. If we don't understand the concept of one foot in front of the other, we are not going to be able to run, we're not going to be able to jog, we're not going to be able to do any of those other things. So that's why we learn about scales, we learn about the easier ways to do things in order to make sure that the concept makes sense. Okay? So moving on here, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about the uh, modifiers that we are going to be using. Once again, they were perfect, major, and minor. And we're going to base this off of the pitch C because it is the starting, which we also call the tonic pitch of our C major scale. So we're gonna begin with the perfect interval. And this is going to refer to simple, simple intervals of the unison, fourth, fifth, and octave. It also refers to the compounds. So if we're talking about that, it would be 11ths, 12ths, 15ths, various things like that. When constructing the perfect interval, you're going to think of the scale. So that C major scale, C to C, using all those different letters. You're going to recall the first, fourth, fifth, and eighth note of the scale. And like it says right here, please note that eighth is going to refer to the number eight, not the rhythm. So we're not talking about eighth notes. We are talking about the eighth note in the scale. So in the C major scale, we would know that C is one because that's where we start. As we continue through the keyboard, F is number four, G is five, and our next C, we have that little tick mark to show that it's an octave higher, would be our eighth pitch in that scale. So looking here, the modifier we use is called perfect. Now, yes, it is called a perfect first right there. Perfect unison is another way to say that. Then we have our perfect fourth from C up to F, a perfect fifth from F to G, and a perfect octave or perfect eighth is going to be C to C. Now, please make sure you are using the bottom note right here. The intervals that we are building are built off of the bottom pitch, the first one that we see right there. When we're using the perfect modifier, we're going to abbreviate that with a capital P. So the takeaway is that we are going to make sure we are using perfect unisons right there for the note that is the same. A perfect fourth when it moves up four pitches, so C to F. A perfect fifth when it moves up five pitches. And then a perfect octave when it is the same note, one octave higher. All right, so there's your takeaway for your perfect modifier. Moving on to our next modifier, we have major. So a major interval is going to refer to simple intervals of second, third, sixth, and seventh. It also does refer to their compounds, so those ninths, tenths, thirteenths, and fourteenths. So when we're constructing this, we have to once again consider the scale, and we are going to think of the second, third, sixth, and seventh pitches in the scale. These intervals are going to naturally occur in the major scale, so that means we don't need to change them in any way. So in the C major scale, D is our second, E is our third, A is the sixth, and B is the seventh. To illustrate this, we look here and we see that we have our major second because we move up to that second pitch right there. Major third would be moving up to the third, major sixth, and major seventh. So once again, using that bottom pitch, we can see where that's going to go. So to abbreviate this when we're creating these labels, we would have a capital M. That's what we would want to use for our major second, major third, etc. Uh, so once again, these occur naturally in any major scale. So all you have to do is think of the correct number and it will give you that automatic label. The last modifier type we are going to be looking at is called the minor. Now this can get a little bit confusing, but I want you to hang with me because it's reasonably simple once you understand the concept, okay? So a minor interval uses the same intervals as major seconds, thirds, sixths, sevenths, and their compounds. When we're creating the minor interval, 
we first start off with our major interval. So we just think of the note that's in the scale. And then we are going to lower it by one half of a step. So these are not naturally occurring intervals, so they require an accidental. Okay, so we do need to change our pitch. We're not changing the letter name though. Be very clear about that, ladies and gentlemen. We are not changing the letter name. We are changing the, the sound of the pitch. We are lowering that pitch by half a step. So in the C major scale, we remember that D is two, E is three, A is six, and B is seven. So to lower each of those pitches, we would then have a D flat, E flat, A flat, and B flat. And we do not use a sharp symbol because we are lowering our pitches. And as we remember, when we lower pitches, if we're talking about coming down chromatically, we are typically going to be using flats. So looking here, we can see that the second is a minor second when it goes from C to D flat right there, because our major second is C to D. To lower it by half a step gives us that minor interval. The minor third would be from C to E flat. Minor sixth is to A flat, and minor seventh is to that B flat. When we abbreviate that minor modifier, we're going to use a lowercase m. And always remember that these are not naturally occurring within the major scale. You do need to create these by adding that accidental, lowering that pitch by one half a step, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, that is the lesson that we've got here today. There will be some self-check questions that I would like you guys to make sure you are doing and uh, working to make sure that you are understanding the concept of major, minor, and perfect intervals. If you have any questions, please reach out. That's what I'm here for. I'm always here to help you, and I uh, would love to make sure that you guys understand this to the very best of your ability. So let's head on over to our self-check questions and make sure that we are picking up this concept.